Uh, we start today with an apology, which I will get round to in just a moment. Who's apologising? Uh, we are. Me as well? Oh, you more than me. Oh, right. Trust me. You oh, more, I know where you're going now. You yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are a number of housekeeping yeah. announcements that I would like to make. Do not miss tomorrow's show. Uh, we have a one-hour extended special, and our friends in Australia are getting very excited <laughs> about our guest. I am too. It's uh, a conversation I've wanted to have with him for a long time now. We've got the tools during the stoppage of the live football, and so tomorrow is unmissable, I mm. promise you. Uh, and yes, those of you who have contacted me and said, um, the studio seems to change, not much, but on a daily basis, there's something very different about it. You're right. Um, those who haven't yet noticed, have a look around. It's, it's, it's kind of a TV version of Spot the Difference. Do you remember yes, those? Remember all those that. years yeah, ago? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm looking for a message that came in overnight uh, from Anthony Hudson, who was watching us in Chicago yesterday. Yes, Anthony's a good friend. Yeah. Very good friend of the yeah, channels. Yeah. He is now the USA's under 20 manager. So thank you for getting in touch, Anthony. And the rest Anthony of Anthony has gone around, hasn't he? Oh. He's been, I remember, <laughs> I think Anthony's been in Jordan. Has he yeah. been in Australia? Uh, Oman, New Zealand. Australia? He's been all over. But, and now uh, he's in? The US, under 20s manager. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, so much today um, that was the same as yesterday's newspapers. Will mm. they, won't they, mm -hmm. when, or if, if at all. Um, Aston Villa have confirmed that they could be without two key players should the Premier League uh, continue. And they are players, one of which is an asthmatic and is concerned and the other whose wife is pregnant right now and is concerned about his mm -hmm. and her well-being. Mm -hmm. And it's something actually that Chris Wilder said mm -hmm. yesterday, if a player doesn't want to play, we understand so it, entirely. Yes. But it does start to, I, I think, dilute and diminish the competition a little bit. Um, KPMG, the accountants, have revealed that uh, player values could be slashed by almost nine billion going forward <laughs> with <laughs> Liverpool, Real Madrid and Barcelona amongst the worst hit. Well, that, wow. I think, was an inevitability yeah, as well. Absolutely. Christian Perslow, the chief exec at the aforementioned Aston Villa, saying, uh, relegation for us is a £200 million catastrophe. Wow. And the conversation about whether to start again or not is a little bit like Brexit. It is tearing the Premier League apart. Villa are insisting they will not play in neutral venues. Uh, Richard Bevan, the chief exec of the League Managers Association, saying yesterday, agree to neutral grounds or the season will be cancelled. What the government is saying is they want games played outside densely populated areas. Mm -hmm. Good luck with that. I yeah, mean, good I, luck I, with that. I, I can't think where that would <coughs> be the case. Good luck with that. Here's a prediction. What day is it? It's Thursday. By this time next week, Leagues 1 and 2 will have been abandoned, in my view. Mm -hmm. Gone. Yeah, and As I a meet Wednesday, I think the money it's going to take to get those leagues played to a conclusion is going to be far greater than that which they could save, bank, and start again with next week. Well, I those, think they will clubs, abandon un, Leagues 1 see, and 2. See, unlike Premier League clubs, over, 1 and 2 depend on fans. Yes. They depend on gate money. That's, yes. that's the biggest, about 35%, 40% of their income comes from gate money, unlike Premier League clubs. Back page of the mail, the uh, um, Premier League have said to those at the bottom end saying, we don't want relegation, <laughs> we'll send you down anyway. No, you won't. Uh, Brian Reid <laughs> in the Daily Mirror, he's right. Whichever way this goes now, as he, the, the last paragraph in a really good art, uh, article from Brian, with tens of thousands killed by this pandemic, the worst thing that could happen to football now is, if it returned or if it failed to, that is based on a lie. I think we've had a lot of misinformation to date. Listen, the, the, the world, of, I'm afraid, Richard, and the, the, the social media world we live in, um, there's a lot out there that's nonsense. It's not just social media, Andy. No, but it's, I, I the majority it's, comes from there. And, I think and you, you think governments are doing the same? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, obviously. They're not going to tell us everything. The K-League starts tomorrow with a lot of interest. They've done deals for their live football uh, with uh, France and Germany and 10 really? other countries, including China, Hong Kong, Croatia. Um, wow. But it comes back with no spitting, close conversations or goal celebrations. No goal celebrations, uh, which are to be banned by the Premier League should ultimately it return. Uh, nine Premier League clubs will let players skip Project Restart over fears they'll infect family mm -hmm. vulnerable to coronavirus once again. So the integrity of the league is undermined if some big players decide they don't want to come back. Yeah, and there will be. Yeah, there will be. Yeah, there will be. Uh, a subject I mentioned yesterday, Andy, that we were going to discuss at length and we now don't have the time because um, we weren't expecting to be in company today. I'm delighted to say we are and we'll introduce you to our guest in just a moment. But it was this article from the Daily Mirror the other day 
um, by Patrice Evra. Um, just to put a little bit of background to this, when we were on the radio, mm -hmm. very good friend of mine, lovely, lovely guy, the former Manchester United reporter on the Manchester Evening David News, Meek. David Meek, yeah. the late David Meek, who got his job in the most awful of circumstances. He succeeded the previous correspondent, killed in Munich yeah. in 1958 a font of all knowledge yeah. to the back end of his career in semi-retirement he was just writing Fergie's mm. notes mm -hmm. the day that Fergie quit was unusual for me because a nine o'clock announcement well announcement a nine o'clock leak most most unusual usually these things are stage managed if a, mm -hmm. if a Manager of significance is leaving a football club <laughs> press I conference. Could, I think you could say he was German. significant. Yeah. <laughs> it, so the, the leak always had me a little suspicious. It fell in our time, if you remember. And David Meek came on our radio program and said, "Well, I was due to meet Fergie yesterday to discuss the notes, and and, and he wasn't there." And he, he said, I'm, "I'm really surprised because I spoke to him 24 hours earlier, and he was insistent everything was well in the world. Looking forward to meeting and discussing the program notes." Now, David went on to suggest he thought maybe he'd been nudged. Uh, Fergie heard and wasn't best pleased with David. No, he wasn't. <laughs> who, who told us the follow-up to the story sometime later. But this is Patrice Evra saying that the headline, Fergie, I am 99% certain to sign these two, Bale and Ronaldo. Okay, 99% certain. He said to Patrice Evra, I have no intention of resigning. I will never retire. I'll be here another 10 years. Then he said, my target is 99% sure we'll have Cristiano Ronaldo and Gareth Bale. I just need these two players to win the Champions League again. 48 hours later, he was gone. Wow. Uh, Patrice Evra goes on to say, I'd spoken to Cristiano who said, yes, yes, it's on. I'm coming back. So what happened? <laughs> what did happen? Well, I think um, I happened who to... Who was chair then? Uh, Martin Edwards, no? Well, David Gill was leaving. Yeah. I don't know if he had left, but he subsequently did. Uh -huh. And Ed Woodward, of course, succeeded. Now, he and Ed didn't get on, haven't got on, ever got on. Well, David Gill loved Fergie, didn't he? David Gill loved Fergie, but with David leaving, the sequence, it was an unusual sequence of events for me. I am still yeah. of the opinion that, that, that there was a little nudge took place. Maybe. Who knows? Oh, Who knows? and one, one last piece of housekeeping. I have to read this to you because we've all seen it, I'm sure. Um, these, these outrageous challenges from Graham Souness. Oh, yes. The, the, the latest is when he's in Rangers blue and playing against, I think, Celtic. And, Mainly uh, Celtic. Yeah. He wasn't uh, particular, though. So <laughs> I, I got this message back from someone I'd sent those pictures to yesterday. He said, uh, uh, he was first class. I know he was top class because he told me. Uh, one of our production staff no. has a telephone, which is uh, ringing at the moment. So Graham told him he was top class, but he said, to be fair, I'd rather play against him in his prime than play against Andy in his prime. Proper striker, Mr. Gray, and a tough nut. You're joking. He'd rather play against me mm -hmm. than Graham? Yes. Oh, no, he'd rather play against Graham than me? No, 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 no. I'd rather play against him in his prime than play against Andy in his. This from an, interna <laughs> an international centre-back who was with us only a couple of days ago, Chris Coleman. Really? Mm. That's a nice compliment, That's isn't it? very nice. Trust me. And that must have been gentle. We can, must have been right as we cookie then. <laughs> Graham so, must have had an off day when he played against Cookie. That's all I can say. Because our guest has, has, well, has crossed swords yes, with Mr. Sunez. Let me Sunez. embellish the apology for Evertonians. Yeah. We make a lot of fuss about uh, anniversaries across the park at, yeah. at Stanley Park. Understandably, Liverpool are top against 30 years since they last won the title. But yesterday, and it did escape our attention, was... It was 35 years to the day that we clinched the we? Everton, clinched the league title uh, for the first time in 15 years uh, against QPR at Goodison. Derek Mountfield, Sharpie got the goals. Oh, we don't it, need to match report. Yeah, well, we, just, we, just, we just want the facts. 35 years yesterday to the day we did that. Right. And apologies, all Evertonians. <laughs> this only came to our attention when we'd, we'd, yeah. we'd come off air. So we, we had to mark it properly with uh, the other half to the uh, legendary gruesome twosome yeah. that were, were inspirational in that title charge. In fact, during that period of time when trophies were littered around Goodison Park. And that, of course, is... Peter Reid. Good morning, Peter. Morning, son. Yes, how are we? Yeah, we're good. Um, I, I... If Andy didn't know that. I, but listen, I was busy concentrating on a show, putting it together, and I, I, I just slipped my mind for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm ashamed, Reedy. I'm ashamed. 
you will be surprised to know I celebrated. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised to know. <laughs> and I think you were a man in demand yesterday. When I called, you were just about to record a vlog with Adrian Heath, who's based these days in, in the US. How is Adrian? Minnesota, yeah, it was a, it was a, a blog for Everton Football Club uh, with uh, Adrian and um, Simon Kendall, uh, the son of the late, great Howard yes. Kendall. So wow. Adrian was great and it was, um, it, was, it was a good show, brought back a lot of memories. We talked about, which, funny enough, uh, Andy, we talked about meeting in the Holiday Inn on the sad occasion of Howard's funeral, yes. where you made me drink alcohol. <laughs> Do you believe that, Richard? I, I believe the two of you probably did drink alcohol, yeah. I, well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll finish the story if you want quickly. You see, when we arrived at the funeral, and I, and Reedy, I said to Reedy, we'll have a glass of champagne before we go, just to toast the boss. And he went, no, 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 I'm not drink it. I said, sorry, sorry. I said, Do you honestly believe Howard's looking down on us right now? and he expects you not to have a glass of champagne to toast them. He went, get the bottles in. <laughs> <laughs> See, the, the reason I said I wasn't drinking, because I was speaking, yeah, and, you I, and I, I was obviously nervous, because if, if anybody has socialised with Mr. Gray, one um, usually becomes more than one. <laughs> Peter, I wanted to, I'm glad you mentioned Howard because yeah. whenever this story is told about that period of time, you and Andy get a great deal of credit, understandably and rightly so. But in some ways for me, it rather negates what Howard contributed. We don't talk about that often enough. You went on to work with him again at Manchester City. What sort of guy was he and what was it about him that inspired players to want to play and become winners? His man management was outstanding. Um, he he was a he was an arm round you sort of manager. I mean, the, the story when I when my first day training at Everton, I'd, I'd celebrated the night before, and I was embarrassing in the training session. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the balls bouncing off me. We had a little sprint run. I did it with Howard. He lapped me. <laughs> I I was embarrassed. Colin Harvey said after the training session, the manager wants to see you. And so I went in, and before he said anything, I said, Gaffer, I've got to apologise for my performance today. I celebrated too much last night. That isn't me. He said to me, uh, Pete, do you like a drink, lad? And I said, yeah. And he said, you've got a great chance at this football club. Go on. Now, it's, it's funny, but psychological, that's good management. Mm -hmm. He know I've done wrong. He isn't battering me. Get on with it. Don't happen again. And that was him. You know, me and Andy I, I, were goodbyes. At the time, he bought Adrian Heath, a young player. Kevin Sheedy, a young player. Neville Southall, a young player. Um, you know, Paul Bracewell. You, he brought a lot of good young players. Mm -hmm. Trevor Stephen. He them together. His tactical awareness... His pre-season were way ahead of his time. So it was a whole melting pot of good ideas, good management. And the biggest thing, he was a lovely, lovely human being. Mm. Mm. It's nice to hear you speak of him in those terms. Mm. When, when you got to Manchester City, how, how did you get to City, by the way? Everton, uh, that, that period of time had come to a close. You're at Queen's Park Rangers. Howard left for uh, Bill... Bill Bowell, Colin Harvey got the job, he brought in Stuart McCall, Paul Bracewell was there, um, Ian Snowden was there, so he, he said to me, I was on the coaching staff, player coach, he said to me, I'm go you're going to be m more coaching, I was about 32, and I said, well, Colin, that's, I, I want to play, you know, playing's, playing's the best thing in the world, mm. play football and getting paid, so he said, well, if you're not going to have many opportunities at Everton. Trevor Francis was manager of QPR, I signed for QPR. A lot of people forget I signed for QPR. Yes, we do, yeah. yeah easily. Yeah, easily forget that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was there once, and then Howard come back from Bilbao, got the job at Man City, hence the phone call, hence 
me going to work oh, with him. Hold on, I'm sorry, think. sorry. Hence the phone call. So there was an illegal approach, was there? <laughs> oh, it used to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But that period oh. of time then back at City, prior to you becoming the manager, again, I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but there was another man management incident there, was there not? The day that you couldn't train? Oh, but I'll, I'll tell you what, we got beat at home by Charlton. And it was, uh, it was, I think it was January, it was icy. And the place, or oh, the crowd weren't happy. The, the old main road, they weren't happy. So we come in the Monday morning. So he says, uh, what do you think, lads? And there was, uh, the facilities at Manchester City were just flat lane. They weren't great. We didn't have an indoor facility. So I said, there's a place in, in, in Old Trafford called Bowlers. Jack Dimmons used to run at the old Lancashire Cricketer. So I said, we'll go to the, we'll go to bowlers and we'll have an indoor fiver side, get the lads at it, with real good session, get them laughing. And he went, ooh. He said, get the catering manager in. And I went, do what? He said, the catering manager. So I got the code and he said, and by the way, get the uh, table tennis up in the players lounge. I said, what? He went to table tennis, so I went, all right. So <clears throat> I went down, got the t so anyhow, got all the lads in there. So he, what he did, he said, right, line up one under the table, use line up the other. And he, he had a bat and I had a bat. So we, he, he went like that. He knocked it over. He said, this is how we'll play. Knock it over, put the bat down, next one on line, knock it over. We'll have a game at table tennis. So I went, you want so he did it, all the lads in there, boom, boom. So the first one who, who knocked it out, who hit it into the net was Mark Ward. So he said, Wardy, out. And by the way, there's a, six plates of Budweiser, open a Budweiser and have a bottle. And that was the training session. We all got absolutely smashed and got taxed <laughs> home. We went on a run where we got beaten two games. We staved off relegation. That's my management. Yeah. It was unbelievable what he did. Mm -hmm. I, I, here's me saying, listen, get them playing, get them working hard. And he just, he got us psychologically. Did, he did, said, did you take that into your own career, no. Peter? Oh, the next game. Did, did you take that into your own career? Did you inherit or, or work with many of the things he taught you? I was going to, let me just say, Reedy, before, I mean, Reedy worked with a lot of managers that influenced him. I'm thinking of Ian Greaves. He influenced you a lot, didn't he? Was that a Bolton, was it, Reedy? Yeah. You know, I was just saying, how, mu how, much of, how much of Ian was in there as well when you took over as coach? Because they, they say that when you go to be a coach, you take bits from each manager you've coached, good and bad. Is that fair? Is that right? Yes, I, I, would, I would agree with that. You can learn of what I call bad management, without a doubt. Ian and Howard had something in common in being... Um, Characters, mm. you know, people's people's managers. I, I, um, I think you're the people's person, Andy. The way you, you go about things, an atmosphere, and them too. I mean, you can be a good manager, being a studious manager. Let's get it. Mm -hmm. Let's get it right. There's different ways to manage. Them to managed in in a way that my character suited. So I took a lot of Ian Greaves mm -hmm. and and certainly. An awful lot of uh, Howard Kendall. How was Kendall's training? Was you know they have sports scientists mm. now and you have monitors mm. on his training in the in the eighties was way ahead of his time in terms of yeah. pre season ball getting the ball out. Yeah. To, you know it wasn't it wasn't thought of back then. You know Ian Greaves used to have you running up hills, which I'm sure Andy yourself did. Yeah. Um, Howard was. Superb. His, his, his training was tapered to the individuals. Kevin Ratcliffe couldn't run 400 metres, couldn't run half a mile, couldn't run, run a mile, but I'll tell you what, he could sprint. Aye. So everything was tailored to sort of the in, individual needs. So, uh, three years as player manager at Manchester City, was it? Yeah, yeah. Finished, three, what, what, were the fin what were the three different finishers? We finished fifth, fifth and ninth. I think my first season, 
I finished above Manchester United and the great Sir Alex Ferguson right. uh, on on the budget that wasn't great. And I think the last the the next one to do it was Roberto Mancini, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> So you ultimately fell out, I think, with the late Peter Swales over money for players. Sunderland we know plenty about, but maybe not some of the stories behind the scenes. Now, after a tremendously successful spell there, you left under a bit of a cloud. Why? I don't know that you've ever actually told us. Why did you well, leave Sunderland? I wouldn't say a cloud. I'd say I, I, I got to Sunderland when they were fourth in the old championship, fourth and bottom. And we got promotion, um, but we got relegated. And to be fair, the chairman stuck with me at the time because we were building a new ground. I had I had a really I had seven and a half years managing in Sunderland. Dear me, that's a long, long time. Mm -hmm. I think you know, uh, and mainly it was brilliant. It was brilliant. And and to be fair, seven and a half years. Have you done your time? Maybe I. Need another challenge. I've got yeah, yeah, yeah. Answers. No, listen. I've heard all this. I, 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 <laughs> by the way, I think you went down the year that Coventry won at Tottenham and survived. But um, that was a great season for us. <laughs> uh, now, I want to know what it is in the minutes of a Sunderland board meeting that you oh, said yeah. was going to lead to the club probably ending up where they are today. You foresaw it. What was that? We built. We built the, the the club built a brilliant stadium, Stadium of Light. Uh, after moving out to Roker Park, uh, forty two thousand people. We we were full every week, and then um, we were. I think we were seventh uh, first time, and then uh, the dinner board meeting. The chairman um, floated the idea to put another six thousand seats on the Stadium of Light. Uh, in the board meeting, I as manager, I said. Uh, I, I don't agree with the uh, that approach. I think this how much it's going to cost should be um, spent on players uh, because it was a cost back then. I don't know, it might have been ten million, six to ten million. Back then, I thought it would have been better trying to get better quality of player. I had a good, a good side, but to get to, from seventh upwards, you need top international players um i was uh, the board decided to put the six thousand seats in and i had to get on with my job and ultimately uh, uh seventh and seventh and then i couldn't replace or i could not get the quality of player in that i thought could could move the club forward mm. so ultimately uh I think about nine games into a season, uh, fourth from bottom, the, ma the chairman decided to to remove me from my post. And so, in short, those six thousand seats uh, have seen Sunderland's um, erratic um, few years, few years, yeah. uh, and subsequently ended up with them where they are now, battling to get out of League One. Well, it was it was a decision that I I didn't think. Uh, I, I I wasn't happy with that attack. I've got to say I I, I thought the forty two thousand uh, was adequate um, for Sunderland Football Club, and ultimately, you know, ultimately, uh, I think the best thing about football clubs is the team on the pitch. That's what wins you things. That's what gets the crowds in. If you haven't got a, a top quality side on the pitch. It's it's a struggle, so it sh it should have been, in my opinion, um, spent on quality players and uh, instead of the capacity of the stadium. Just bringing that up to date a little bit, Peter. We're, we're, amazingly, we run out of time so quickly when we do this half hour. Just bringing up to date, how how different, in your opinion, having been in the game as long as you have, how different is the sport we love going to be when we come through this strange period we're in? Well, I mean, I, I, I hear all the, the clamour about football and getting back to it, and, and I miss it as much as you two guys. But the most important thing is people's health. And I know I know, we're trying to get on uh, behind closed doors, but um, I think the whole essence is the, of the game is the people's game, mm. and I find that difficult. Will it be different? Yes. 
I think um, football will have to have a look at itself from the financial side of the game. Um, the big fees, the big wages. Uh, I think it's going to be... Um, a w Let's just say a warning to the game in general. Um, and like you said before, the most important thing is players' health. I don't think... The, to get... To get football on, I think you have to have... Well, I know you have to have players on the pitch. I'm not too sure the players in this climate will want to play football. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think there's a lot of debate yet as to mm. whether we can or can't and mm -hmm. uh, whether we do or don't. And Correct. It's reflected every day in the papers. Uh, Andy's right, Peter. Uh, we haven't had enough time in your company, but we're very grateful for that time that you have spent with us today. <laughs> and, uh, Eventually, we got him on. I told you he was no good with modern technology. <laughs> took us, it took us about half an hour to get him on here. <laughs> I've got, I've got uh, laptops, I've got iPads, and I, I, I can't use any of them. <laughs> I was, when you, you turn the cable in but with underscore, I, I, I thought it was a <laughs> Yes, the little <laughs> dash that sits on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, great to see you. Thanks, pal. We always say it. Stay safe. Great to see you. Thanks, Reedy. Peter Reed, who still, of course, is very much involved at Wigan Football Club. Yes. So he's... Uh, He's right in the mix as to whether the conversation about whether we start or otherwise actually has a conclusion. Do you but know what I didn't realise there? I knew he had been at Sunderland a while and he, he put a great team together at Sunderland. I mean, the, the, the Quinn Phillips partnership oh. that he put together at Sunderland is something that they could only dream about having mm. again right now, isn't it? Mm. I mean, it was amazing. And he was seven and a half years mm. in. I didn't realise that. That was a great season. We won at White Hart Lane. Sunderland went. Hold on, it was a great season for Coventry. Leeds went, I think, and Middlesbrough went. Oh no, it was oh, it was a wonderful conclusion to the season. <laughs> and I, I felt some guilt looking at Leedy in the tunnel at Wimbledon where they'd failed to get what they needed. Goal. I could go on, but we haven't got the time. No, we haven't. We've I'd like, could start again tomorrow with that tale. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> We've got a better tale tomorrow. We have got a great story tomorrow. Great footballing story. A young man who should have had a leg amputated at seven mm. went on to win every honour that the game had and right at the peak of his powers, walked away. It's an extraordinary story, and we'll share it with you tomorrow. In the meantime, stay safe, everyone.